I honestly didn't know what to expect from Tango Gameworks' Ghostwire Tokyo, but I knew I just had to be hyped for it. It being a brand new AAA IP from my favorite video game developer, Shinji Mikami, I had a hunch that it'd be special. The initial announcement trailer looked genuinely interesting, melding action with horror elements, all taking place in one of the most visually stunning cities in the world. It's been over three years since this mysterious title was released, and while we've gotten a few looks into its gameplay, I don't really think those trailers did a great job at illustrating what Ghostwire is all about. Well, now that I've played through the entire game, thank you Tango and Bethesda, I really appreciate it, I've gotta say. It's pretty awesome. So let's get into it. Unlike their Evil Within series, Ghostwire is not a survival horror game. In fact, it isn't even a horror game at all. It's not trying to scare you. This adventure through ghost-ridden Shibuya is a pure action-adventure spirit hunt. After a cataclysmic event known as The Vanishing occurs in Tokyo, the streets, buildings, and underground are left completely lifeless. Everyone has been snapped out of their physical existence, leaving nothing but their personal belongings and stranded souls behind. Ghostwire begins with our lead character, the only person who hasn't vanished, Akito Izuki, on the brink of death after a motorcycle accident. Akito's body is possessed and revived by a lone spirit named KK. At the same time, ghosts and other demons have crossed over from the spirit world into the world of the living. KK imbues Akito with incredible elemental powers in order to ensure his survival against this growing paranormal threat. It's up to Akito and KK to figure out what's going on and to see if they can save the citizens of Tokyo. Ghostwire's combat system is extremely interesting. The game is played from a first-person perspective. Each of your attacks are technically finger projectiles, but I would never call this game a first-person shooter. It feels more like a magical brawler. Think Heretic or Hexen. There are three elemental powers you can use in battle, these being the rapid wind shot, the horizontal wide-hitting water blades, and the massively damaging fire power, which pierces through bunched-up foes. Each power has a held input. When charged up, wind releases a combo, hitting up to four times depending on the power's level. Water creates a wider blade that can cover groups of enemies, and the fire's charge up sends forth a massive bomb that decimates crowds of enemies. All of the elemental abilities are limited in their use, and use different amounts of ether. You can replenish ether by cracking open corrupted items littered throughout the environment. You can also replenish this resource by grabbing a ghost's core. Damaging a ghost slowly reveals this thing. You can grab cores from a distance using your ghost wire, or get up close and personal, smashing it within your hands. Which, by the way, is very satisfying to see play out every single time. You feel so powerful doing this. The challenge that arises with core grabs is that they aren't always safe. Akito has to perform a complicated hand sign to destroy the core, essentially having to be stationary leaving him open to enemy attacks. Choosing when and where you core grab is important for taking out hordes of ghouls effectively. If you're completely dry on ether, you still have a few more options to defend yourself with. There are multiple talismans that are more support item than straight up weapon. Talismans like locking enemies in place and revealing ghost cores faster. Pair both of these talismans together with something like Windshot, and you'll be wiping out phantoms with little effort. There are stealth takedowns that you can perform, but I've never completed a full enemy encounter in stealth. I found it useful in whittling down enemy numbers before taking them head on. If said enemies get a little too close for comfort, you can always block their attacks. There's also a perfect parry that functions differently depending on the enemy and how you've upgraded yourself. The final defensive option at your disposal is your bow. Early on, the bow will most likely be your last resort. Firing quickly, accurately, and deadly. Arrows are powerful, but somewhat limited. You can find them around town or purchase them from a cute little nekomata at your local konbini. I guess it kind of speaks to the strength of the battle system, with the game's available super hard mode, which turns off leveling, meaning you have to rely on the pure functionality of each tool in your loadout. It might take some time wrapping your head around how each power works against the variety of enemies, but it's rewarding when you finally learn how to annihilate groups of enemies in style. Speaking of those special specters, Ghostwire is filled with a plethora of perilous poltergeists. Each enemy is based on a particular trope within Japanese society. The most numerous foes you'll be fighting are the Rainwalkers. These very slender-looking individuals represent the tired and often overworked businessmen archetype that you'll see all the time in Japan. There's one called a paper doll, which represents the expectation of keeping up a happy, friendly facade that many women have to employ in the workplace. I think it's super interesting that Mikami and his team chose to explore these ideas, these 
negative emotions that power the evil forces of this game world. Through its enemies, side quests, and some of the story content, Ghostwire is saying a lot about Japan, not necessarily criticizing the culture, but kind of putting a spotlight on certain things through its gameplay. That's all really awesome, but I bet you're wondering how these enemies play. Well, they're a bit of a mixed bag. At the start, that Slenderman dude I mentioned would barely ever attack, opting to stumble around like a moving target. Some of the Berserker enemies, like the Students of Misery and Pain, get in your face and kind of carry the slack of the Rainwalkers. As you progress and encounter more of the variety of what you'll be fighting, the combat does open up and get better, but it did feel like I was decimating everything for a while. It's worth noting that I played about half of the game on normal mode and found it very easy. Switching to hard difficulty was the perfect encouragement in upping my skills and actually learning how each tool in my kit worked against each adversary. Later on, the Rainwalkers evolve into more aggressive variants, like the larger, rugged walkers, who use their umbrellas as shields covering themselves and their allies, forcing you to use your piercing firepower against them. The Rain Slashers finally get in your face more and hit very hard. The Paper Dolls use their very bullet hell-like attacks more frequently and buff other active enemies, which usually makes them a top priority target. Target. I remember being confused on how I was supposed to dodge the incoming bullet hell. At first I was tanking it all with my shield, while also getting guard broken. Then I remembered I was playing a first person game, and that I could just crouch under the shots. It's combat minutia like this that makes Ghostwire feel a bit more charming than other action games. There are tons of other enemies, like the legend that Lady D from Village is based off of, and a plethora of flying enemies that almost require the bow to combat successfully. Once you memorize how each enemy fights and master all of of your offensive options, you'll almost feel like Akito using his hand signs to quickly swap between all of your weapons with the controller's touchpad. Overall, Ghostwire's combat system is pretty good. It's not the best gameplay loop out there, it's nothing mind-blowing, and it definitely has the potential for getting repetitive, especially on the normal difficulty, but it's still a loop that I genuinely enjoyed my time with. But combat is only one half of this title's appeal. The other is the explorable open world Tokyo. Ghostwire is half ghost hunting adventure, half Shibuya tour guide. The amount of Japanese culture on display at all times in this beautifully crafted open world was more than enough to satiate my ultra weeb appetite. I love how much this game wants to teach its player about its culture through its collectibles, landmarks, side quests, and all of the fantastically adapted mythology. There are so many yokai appearances in this title Title that had me snapping my fingers and pointing at the screen. Ghostwire's open world is drop-dead gorgeous, and not as overwhelming like many other open worlds tend to be. As you make progress through the story, more of the map is unlocked, essentially being drip-fed through major events in the narrative. This isn't unlike other open world games, and yes, you do have to unlock sections of the map by cleansing Tori shrines. These shrines absorb the deadly fog that's responsible for snapping everyone out of existence. When unlocked, the in-game map does have tons of icons on it, but I turned mostly everything off and discovered a lot of the game's content naturally, and it felt great. I mean, the PS5 controller makes sounds and vibrates as you approach a collectible, which made me feel like I was playing Zelda or something. By default, the game also has a lot of navigational HUD elements that I also turned off, leaving just the overhead compass. The compass is everything you need for an immersive experience. All relevant icons are displayed on it. Shibuya is already a very well-designed city. It's kind of all the navigation you'll probably need. There are a bunch of clearly identifiable landmarks that make up for the lack of objective markers. Besides legging it through the streets, you can also glide from rooftop to rooftop like Batman. It's pretty badass. Various tengu litter the skyline and these friendly yokai help you in getting to higher ground. From on high, you can observe your surroundings, picking out each landmark and place of interest, then just glide and grapple your way around. Taking full advantage of the PS5's hardware, you can tell Tango Gameworks had a lot of fun mapping out and faithfully recreating Shibuya. In real life, Tokyo is basically under construction all the time. When this game started its development back in 2017, Shibuya saw a lot of construction. This is represented in Ghostwire, and it's oddly nostalgic to see. The overall visual presentation is amazing too. The devs really didn't skimp on delivering true next-gen visuals for the characters, locales, and all of the cats and dogs you can feed and talk to. Literally, you can read their minds, and they give you helpful tips on finding collectibles, and they can bring you two secret treasure stashes. It's freaking amazing. I love it. I played the game on PS5 in high frame rate mode, so that means 120 FPS, and I got a very smooth experience and never noticed a single drop in quality or any game-breaking bugs. 
Ghostwire's Tokyo is amazing looking and packed with things to do. Its neon and rain-drenched streets give it an almost cyberpunk feel. If we ever get a modern Blade Runner game, I could only hope it would look this good. Concept design legend Ikumi Nakamura worked on this game as a creative director for a while, and you could feel her work through the visual design. Everything from the environments to the characters have such a consistent cyber-cool aesthetic, with a very thick layer of Japanese mythology overlaid. It's so cool seeing techware and kabuki combined into breathtaking character designs. With that said, the amount of techware outfits that Akito can sport in the cutscenes made me so happy as a fellow street fashionista. Although I will admit, I mostly went for the Kojima fit. Good looks aside, the amount of side content packed into this game is pretty sick. As you explore, you'll be meeting a lot of stranded souls looking for help in passing on. These are your side quests. I'll start by saying I think about 85% of the side quests are great, the remaining not so much. So a lot of the lost souls you speak to have really cool mini stories to follow. A lot of the time these side quests have their very own interiors that's a uniquely handcrafted environment for a piece of content you might never experience. I love that so much. What I don't love are the various copy and pasted yokai hunts and horde mode style side quests. Oh, what's that? I gotta check out this ancient cursed tree? That sounds so cool, I wonder what's gonna happen. Oh, it's just another kill all ghosts until the mission ends side quest. The spoken dialogue with these particular quests repeats too. The exact same things are said every time you complete one of these. This might grate on some players, but for me personally, the amount of good side quests definitely made up for the lame ones. There's so much personality in these Lost Souls stories. They go from simple things like retrieving a piece of jewelry for a departed woman, to helping a long-dead business owner find out why all of his employees quit their jobs. Like I mentioned earlier, this aspect of the game dives a bit deeper into Japan's societal woes. Some of this stuff is thought-provoking when you have the context of how businesses are run or how certain people are treated in Japan. There was one really good one involving a hikikomori that I won't spoil completely, but the game uses the ghost theme with real-world issues like being a shut-in or a hoarder really effectively, in my opinion. It's all quite fun and well-written. Whether you're helping a guy who literally died on the toilet, or helping a troubled old man see cherry blossoms bloom one final time before passing on, Ghostwire's side content is definitely worth doing. I won't be talking too much about the main story as to avoid spoilers for you guys. It's good, but a little basic. I was impressed by the amount of genuinely well-made cutscenes right at the start. Very early on, the game proves that it's a big AAA experience, flexing all of the latest graphical bells and whistles. One of the major goals of the game is to heal Tokyo, and our two lead characters, Akito and KK, are the biggest strengths of this story. They start off not liking each other. KK is literally possessing Akito and forcing him to go on this wild ghost hunting adventure. Pretty soon, the two become pals and display some pretty good chemistry with each other. KK comes off as like a proud father figure as Akito progresses in becoming a badass ghost hunter. Which, speaking of him, he is a great action protagonist. He has a very personal reason for wanting to save Tokyo, as he makes his way deeper into his own personal spirit quest. He falters and fails throughout this story. The game also does this thing that I love, where at the start of the game, during combat, Akito is scared of the enemies and unsure about his abilities, but by the end he's telling the ghosts to coldly stay out of his way as you take them all down one by one. I just love seeing the progression from zero to hero. Akito and KK bicker a lot throughout the game, whether you complete a side quest or just go shopping. It's fun seeing them become friends because they go through some pretty crazy stuff together. It's interesting seeing how Akito deals with certain spirits, too. He is an older brother, and one interesting detail that I thought was really freaking cool was how he deals with the Forlorn enemy. Forlorn are siren-type enemies that call in others to deal with you. They're also a representation of child abuse. Instead of violently ripping out this enemy's core, you have to carefully sneak up behind them and perform a sending hand sign which removes them from the battle in a non-violent way. I really love that because through the gameplay, you're actually getting a little insight insight into Akito's character. Being a mature older brother, he wouldn't hurt such a young spirit like this even if they were trying to hurt him back. Believe it or not, but there are other characters in this game too. <laughs> and while I think some of them are really good, a lot of them are unfortunately pretty flat. The main villain is kinda one note, and you don't really learn anything about him through the cutscenes. 
It's all basically relegated to the optional audio logs that you'll find throughout the open world. Towards the end of the story, another character that we hear a lot about just kind of shows up and has a big exposition dump, and it feels misplaced, like it should have happened way earlier, or maybe told in pieces throughout the story. With all of that said, I did enjoy the game's narrative overall, and I even got a little teary-eyed by the end. One of the themes that all of the characters go through in this title is accepting death and maybe this part of the story was hitting a little too close to home for me personally, but I thought it was really great. The acting is very good on the Japanese side, but you can play the game in English as well. And I did do this for a little bit. It was good, but I haven't finished the game in English, so I can't speak to that fully. One thing I can confidently speak to is that Ghostwire is awesome. It's like all of the things that I love brought to life. Japan, techware, ghosts, horror, cyberpunk aesthetics, cool magic, it's all here. For as much as I loved all of that, and seeing it all come to life in a AAA big budget action game, a lot of it is definitely held back by the early, almost nothingness feeling I got out of the game's rather simple combat. Stick with it and things totally get better though. If you're looking for a fresh IP that's doing things a little differently, please check this title out. It's got fun combat that might get old for some players, great exploration in a vastly beautiful game world, and a fun story that has its hard-hitting emotional moments. If you want to play this game, well, that's kind of where the problem lies. Ghostwire is available on PC, but PS5 is your only option if you don't have a monster rig. Yeah, the console that you can't currently buy without supporting scalpers. I'm pretty sure I heard somewhere that the game will eventually come to Xbox platforms, but for now it's exclusive to Sony's very rare console. If you do have the means to play it, I highly recommend you do so. You know, after you're done being absorbed by Elden Ring. But yeah, the effort put in by Tango Gameworks is very present. Even though I'm not the biggest fan of some of their previous work, they always make very fun experiences. And this one right here is definitely my favorite of theirs. It's rare we ever get fresh ideas in mainstream gaming, so I really hope Ghostwire is successful as an IP, because I'd love to see Ghostwire become like a crazy anthology series tackling different themes and cultures. Like, imagine Ghostwire Paris or Ghostwire Las Vegas. It'd be so cool. But for now, only time will tell.